Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is the slide that we left off with last time. We saw the three different regimes. P going to infinity, as you will show in, on the homework, will actually lead to particle in a box like state, so discrete energy levels. P equals zero, that's the free electron, and we know the electron can travel at any k, at any momentum, at any velocity. It's not discretized, and so we get the continuum. And we also now, the most interesting case, look at an intermediate uh, barrier strength, P, where we get energy bands. So sort of a mixture of continuous uh, bands and uh, energy gaps between them. Okay. So in uh, crystals, you get the first and the third picture simultaneously. In fact, because when you, when you look at it, uh, we have these core electrons uh, that are stuck uh, to the ions okay, um, and uh, cannot travel freely. Uh, and that's sort of like uh, a P going to infinity. They're really, uh, those electrons, those inner electrons will be stuck to their particular ion and they will always stay with that ion or in the vicinity of that ion. Okay, and then we also have um, the um, valence electrons. Those are the more loosely bound electrons, and, and they correspond to uh, a picture of some intermediate p-value. There is some, some uh, energy cost to leaving a particular ion that they're near at any given moment near to, but they would be able to uh, hop over to the next ion. Okay, so that's sort of the, the general picture, but for us now, um, we wanna shift gears a little bit and look at uh, these energy gaps from another point of view. Can we find a more physical or a more intuitive way of understanding why they arise? Right now, it's been uh, pretty uh, closely tied to the math of the chronic, chronic uh, penny model, but uh, we'd like to sort of step back a little bit and see if there's another way that's not so tied to the formalism that we can understand them. So why do they arise for an electron, for electrons in an ion lattice? Okay, so that's the question we'd like to address. And let's start sort of conceptually a little bit. Uh, the physics always has to come first. It is in this, the math is only in the service of physics in this course. <laughs> uh, some of you are double majors, so uh, you have to uh, choose a side here. Um, and the side is physics. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, most electrons sort of can wiggle right through the lattice. And what I mean by that uh, is some picture like this. Here's, here's our um, ion lattice okay, with some clearly defined lattice planes, okay? Here are the dotted lines indicating the lattice planes, and here's an electron now traveling through at some kind of wavelength, okay? But I would say that the uh, lattice doesn't perturb the electron very much uh, in general, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but there are some specific k values or specific wavelength of the electron where that statement is not true okay and there's particularly uh two cases where that's definitely not true the statement that uh the lattice doesn't perturb the electrons much so here again uh, are the ions and now i'm drawing a particular wavelength for the electron okay and you kind of see that the wavelength of the electron wave function matches, in a sense, the periodicity of the lattice here in this picture. I'm going to call this uh, state A. Okay. And then here's another uh, state of, a, of the same wavelength. Um, okay, and I'm going to call that state B. But again, in both cases, uh, we have sort of a uh, congruity, if you will. Okay, so <clears throat> why would um, the electrons be perturbed in these, these particular states, A and B? Well, 
if you notice here in state A, the electron is always likely to be right on top uh, of an ion, right? So mm, if you think in terms of probability density, the probability density is always maximized right on top of an ion, okay, in the vicinity of an ion. Whereas down here, the electrons are sort of always found in between the ions, never on top of uh, an ion, but sort of always in between. So here again, we would say that the probability density is maximized in the region between uh, neighboring ions. So what wave number k does the electron have in these two cases, in, in these two instances? Well, basically, if you look at the picture, the wavelength is exactly two times the lattice spacing. Lambda is equal to 2a, where a is the lattice spacing, or we could also call it the lattice constant, often called. All right, so uh, what k value does that correspond to? A quick calculation reveals that uh, the wave number uh, is just evaluates to pi over a. Hmm, interesting, right? So that we make a mental note of that. Pi over a is appearing here. Okay, and so the question now is why would the electrons have fairly different energies uh, in the situ in those two situations, A and B, okay? And here, let's actually draw the potential energy landscape uh, here in green, okay? And um, with the plus symbols there, I'm just indicating where the electrons, I mean, sorry, where, where the ions are uh, at any given moment here. So this is sort of an x-axis right here. Okay, so whenever you get very close to an ion, then the potential energy uh, drops um, quite um, precipitously. Yeah, so that's the energy, potential energy landscapes. And so now, can we figure out why um, the energy of state A would be much less than the energy in state B? Well, yeah, easy, right? So the electrons tend to hang out in between the ions and state B. That's where the potential energy is the largest or the least negative, if you will. But in state A, they're hanging out close to an ion, so that's where they're most tightly bound, and that's where the potential energy is most negative. And so it's very clear from, from this conceptual reasoning that V sub A would be much less than V sub B. Okay, so here's just the summary of what I just said. Okay. Now, uh, there is another closely related picture that we have to now establish, and that is Bragg scattering. Okay, so what is Bragg scattering? We discussed it a little bit in uh, 212. But basically, we have, again, our ion lattice here with the well-defined planes, and now we have an X-ray beam come in, okay, and uh, get diffracted or reflected, I should say, from the lattice like this. So we have some incoming X-rays. <clears throat> some of them go in further, for sure, uh, into the lattice, but some of them will be reflected. So there's also part of them that goes further. But we also do get some reflections, but only when a certain condition is met. Okay, so only uh, when the Bragg condition is satisfied. What is the Bragg condition? Uh, it is given here by 2a times the sine of theta is equal to some integer of the wavelength of the x-rays. So here a is the lattice constant, as always, and the angles here are the the angle of uh, incidence and the angle of reflection. So we have to satisfy uh, that condition for x-rays, but this also actually incidentally works for electrons too because they too have a wavelength, you know, the de Broglie wavelength. So the picture still works for electrons. 
And furthermore now, let's simplify and make uh, the theta just 90 degrees. They're coming in, um, you know, uh, orthogonal to the lattice planes. We want basically electrons in one dimensions. Okay, and then the Bragg condition reads just simply 2a is equal to some multiple, some integer multiple of lambda. Okay, uh, and we can convert that into a wave number. Uh, and lo and behold, we get some multiple of pi over a. Again, this pi over a uh, creeps in. Okay, so that seems to be, and here also 2 pi over a and 3 pi over a and so on. So at these special wave numbers, uh, the Bragg formula says we should get reflection. Okay, so this is actually quite important for us because uh, at other wave numbers, we wouldn't expect sort of a right traveling electron to be backscattered or reflected back. We, we would expect it to just continue on. But at these particular wave numbers or wavelengths, we would expect some significant reflection, okay? And so when an electron has one of these values, at k values, uh, it, it uh, you know, gets uh, reflected uh, to some degree. And we can say then that we have sort of a superposition of uh, right-traveling electrons, but since they also get reflected, left-traveling electrons, sort of a superposition of incoming and outgoing electrons, and uh, we get these standing waves, therefore. Okay, we wouldn't get it in, at other k-values necessarily, but at these k-values, we definitely get standing waves. And so the wave uh, function, I'm sorry, the, okay, so, and then we can say that the velocity of the electron must be uh, zero there. Okay, uh, we can say, all right, since the electron is a wave, the velocity would probably be um, given by the group velocity. Uh, and the group velocity is represented by this derivative uh, of omega with respect to k, the dispersion curve slope, right? Uh, but for us, uh, omega is related to e via an h bar. And so we actually also get that this dE dk, this derivative should be zero at um, k is equal to say pi over a, also two pi over a and so on. And if you look at uh, the graph, uh, that is absolutely the case, not for the free electron parabola, but for the uh, chronic penny uh, curves. In any case, um, the more important point now is that at these special k values, uh, we get um, reflection or diffraction from the lattice and uh, the wave function psi of x can now no longer be represented by you know, e to the i kx. Why is that? Because that represents simply only a right moving electron. Okay, instead, we need a right moving and a left moving electron Okay, here's one moving to the right, but part of the wave function also has to uh, represent the reflected part, so the left traveling electron. And um, therefore we get, using Euler's formula, we get two times the cosine of pi over a times x. Okay, then when we look at the probability density, we have to do a psi star psi. Okay, and that is then giving us just simply a cosine squared. If I draw that on the x-axis, that's what it would sort of look like, right? That's what it would look like. All right. Now, there is another superposition that uh, we can contemplate, another basic superposition of right and left. Okay, all I've changed here is uh, a sign. Okay, instead of adding the two components, we can subtract them. It's another uh, basic superposition, okay? In this case, though, we get uh, a psi star psi that is proportional to the sine squared instead of the cosine squared. When I draw that, then it looks like this. So again, we get this picture of uh, two states. Unfortunately, now I'm calling it one and two. Before, I was calling it A and B. Same thing, okay? Two states where in one state, um, the um, 
probability density for the electron location is always maximized uh, near an ion, and in the other state, it is always maximized in between ions. So same idea. Okay. So again, just to summarize here, uh, we get these two possible electron configurations that are both consistent with the Bragg condition uh, for backscattering, for reflection, if you will. Uh, psi one, sorry, a row one of x and row two of x. Row here now is the probability density. Okay, that's my new symbol for probability density. So they all don't always have to write psi star psi. I'm going to just call it rho, the density of the electron, electron density, if you will. Okay, so that's what psi now is going to stand for. And so now we can ask, okay, what about the electron energies? I'm trying to try to become a little bit more quantitative now. Okay, we'd like to evaluate the potential energy of an electron that is in state one or state A, capital A, <laughs> um, and uh, versus a, an electron that is in state two or state B. How do I do that? Well, I'm gonna have I'm gonna try to convince you that uh, we have to do this integral that I uh, have here on the board. Okay, and so. Um, before I try to convince you that that is the right equation, let's just step back for a second and look at our picture again. Okay, free electron uh, and uh, chronic, chronic penny model. We get this band gap there at pi over a, and we want to find uh, the energy difference between those two points at k is equal to pi over a. We want to call that the band gap there. Okay, so that's our um, goal, ultimately, is to find that the size of that band gap. So, but back to the formula, right? So if the electron were, were a com point particle, completely spatially localized, then it'd be easy to evaluate its potential energy because it would just be given by V of X, X being the electron location. I just basically say, all right, the electron is uh, exactly one nanometer to the right of the origin and uh, the potential energy at that very point is minus 10 electron volts. And that would then be the um, potential energy for the electron. Okay, so if it were a point particle, it'd be very easy. But we're not dealing with point particles here. We're dealing with uh, smeared out waves for the electron. So um, the potential energy obviously always depends on position. But um, uh, now I can't evaluate that function at a unique point in location in space. Okay, So I have to take an average. So those of you who have taken some uh, quantum mechanics will uh, recognize this integral psi star times um, v times psi dx. But really for us, that would just be an integral of the probability density times v of x. And so we have to, so it's sort of an average, uh, psi of x, I mean, rho of x rather, not psi. Rho of x gives you um, the distribution the spatial distribution of the electron, and V of x is uh, what the potential energy would be okay, at these various different locations. Okay, so we have to evaluate such integrals uh, in order to uh, make quantitative progress. And so that will be next time. All right, thank you.